This is OMS Voices, an Amos podcast. I'm Bill Klaproth, and with me is Dr. Dan Hammer, who is here to discuss his OMS contributions through military service. Dr. Hammer, thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot, Bill. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for your service. This is uh, very cool, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about what you've done as an OMS in the military. So can you give us a brief overview of your career? Yeah, absolutely. So first, how did I get into the Navy? I don't come from a military family and I was looking at dental schools and we all know how expensive dental schools are these days. So I looked for a way to pay for it. I'm not going to lie. And I looked at the different branches and it turns out I like being around water, um, not in the middle of a field too often. So the Navy was an obvious choice and I was blessed to be chosen for something called a health professional scholarship program. So the Navy paid completely for my entire dental education. So that, that At the end of dental school, that's when I got my commissioning as a naval officer and went through the officer development school in Newport, Rhode Island, and, you know, kind of did that whole side. And during dental school, I was thinking about oral surgery, but I wasn't 100% convinced. And due to the rigor of the training, I knew I didn't want to go for it unless I knew 100%. So I did a general practice residency at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And this was in 2011. So we all know what was going on in the world then, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And unfortunately, we were receiving about 30 to 50 wounded warriors three times a week in Bethesda as they were coming from launch duel. And so the general practice residents actually became the dental service for the wounded warriors because regardless of the injury you needed a dental exam so from that experience doing all the facial trauma triaging for oral maxillofacial surgery pretty much it i knew 100 percent i was never doing general dentistry again and gonna go for uh, omfs and was lucky enough to apply and get in right away and then they stashed me i spent a year in camp lejeune north carolina with the marines uh doing my fleet marine force time which was just incredible i mean just being in that marine culture it was absolutely amazing and then i went back to walter reed for my training And from there, during my time, we did a lot of great things, but we also missed the boat with some of our reconstructions due to technology integration. So it spurred me to do fellowship then in Texas with Fayette Williams and uh, Rod Kim. And then I've landed here in San Diego and have absolutely loved my time. I, I teach residents. We have 12 residents in our program, and it's just been an absolute wonderful experience. So that's where you are now? You're stationed in San Diego? Yeah, I'm uh, vice chair of the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at Navy Medical Center San Diego, just down the road. That's great. So you're also qualified in head and neck oncology and reconstructive surgery, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so you've done it all jack of all trades, hopefully a master or something. Yes. <laughs> right. So when you got into the Navy, did you think, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend my time in the Navy and then I'm going to get out and do private practice. Was that your initial thought? And then you got in the Navy and said, you know what? I really like this. This is a home for me. So I think a lot of us who start with that four-year commitment, I thought that was forever. Right. And then all of a sudden you're at the end of that and you're like, that was a blink of an eye. And one thing the Navy does exceptionally well, or the military in general, is providing educational opportunities. And with those educational opportunities comes more obligation, right? So between my internship, my residency, my fellowships and everything, I got to that 10, 12, 13 year mark. And it's been a blink of an eye. So it was never my plan to get out. It was never my plan to stay in. It's just kind of like a lot of people, you find the right mentors, they open opportunities or make you see opportunities that you may not normally have had a vision of and just been blessed in that way. So what do you think has been the driving force in your career so far? You're very accomplished at this point. What drives you to do this? I think it's just that experience at Walter Reed from 2011 to 2017. Working on the wounded. Wounded warriors. And we had some of the most talented surgeons in the world there. I mean, we were doing such great work and we inadequately reconstructed so many of our service members. And what I mean by that is, you know, they may have had a huge traumatic defect to their face, but okay, maybe their jaw was put back together, but they didn't have teeth, they couldn't speak, they couldn't swallow. They still had a tracheostomy tube, they had a feeding tube and they were quote unquote reconstructed and really what my mission has now become to answer your original question is how do you integrate technology and create protocols to actually restore patients and we need to 
stop thinking about reconstruction and think about restoration. So that's really where my goal is and the value proposition of healthcare and what that really means. So the driving force is really restoration, not Absolutely. just repair. It's getting these men and women back to as normal as can be. Absolutely, not just physically. You know, unfortunately, I, I had a lot of very young patients from Iraq and Afghanistan, and there's a lot of hidden scars and invisible scars from these defects. And I still talk to a lot of the guys I took care of over a decade ago now, and those scars are alive and well. So it's not just restoring physically, it's psychosocial, emotionally, spiritually. The surgery is just a part of it. It sounds like it had a real effect on you, seeing these young kids almost yeah, basically they were come, younger back, than me. come back from war with these types of injuries. Oh, absolutely. What was that like, seeing that? The first thing was a lot of them were younger than me. So that's pretty eye-opening. And I was going through a huge period of growth, right? I was getting trained. I was achieving a lot of my lifelong quote unquote goals and to be sitting across from a 19 year old who came from a, a really tough background and joined the military to really make that big leap and to see them bed stricken and with all those different procedures being done for an extended period of time. I really hated that a lot of them were almost professional patients. You know what I'm saying? Like where did their identity go? So if you restore the patient, hopefully you can restore that purpose and that identity and they're not just a professional patient. Where did their life go? Or where is their life going? What kind of a life can they have after this? Yeah, that really had to have an impact on you to see these people giving so much. Absolutely. At such a young age for our country. Wow. So I know that you've been out. Can you tell us about some of your time in an operational setting and what that was like? Yeah, so I've been blessed to do two different operational settings. One early in my career was at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, like I mentioned with the Marines, which was a, quite an adventure. And then my more Navy traditional side is, it's very common for oral maxillofacial surgeons to go on aircraft carriers right after residency. Pretty much you're guaranteed. So I was on the Abraham Lincoln aircraft carrier in the North Atlanta for a long time in that area of responsibility. And the surgical team on aircraft carrier for six, 7,000 people, it's a general surgeon, an oral surgeon, and a CRNA. And that's it. That's it. For 5,000 plus people. Yeah. And if you add all the other ships around, you're talking about 30,000 people and that's your team. So it's a pretty huge contingency operation going on. Yeah. And you're <laughs> generally talking mainly a lot of young people, probably wisdom teeth and things like that happening. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, it really, the main reason we're there is uh, kind of threefold. One, facial trauma. Two, airway. So emergent airways or surgical airways. And then three is we have our general anesthesia license. So if you're in a mass casualty, the CRNA might be doing work with the general surgeon and we would be able to intubate the patient, start the patient's anesthetic so then the general surgeon can come over. So we're also the backup anesthesia provider. So we really are uh, multiple hats on an operational setting as an oral surgeon. Were you busy all the time? No, I mean, I really was a contingency. So it was mandatory. The ship could not move without the general surgeon, anesthesia provider, or an oral surgeon. So we are 100% mandated for that contingency operation. So I did a lot of cases with the general surgeon. They definitely were a lot more busy than I, but we did have some pretty massive cases. And there's a reason I was there for a contingency. So I took out a couple of wisdom teeth if there was an infection, but I really tried to do that when we were in port, just to not take that sailor away from their job that is needed to be done when we're out at sea. Yeah, well, wow, really, really interesting. And what an adventure, really, if you think about it. Most people that get into the specialty will never spend their life on an aircraft carrier. Generally, they'll get into some kind of private practice and really interesting, the career path that you've chosen. Are there any other milestones in your career that you can share with us? I don't have a, a lot of specific milestones. You know, you can talk about finishing training and all those things that are more standard. What I think is the biggest milestone so far is I arrived to San Diego just over three years ago, and we have built an incredible team around maxillofacial facial restoration. It's multidisciplinary, plastics, ENT, OMFS, general surgery, physical therapy, the list goes on and on and on. And we've really built uh, an incredible digital platform that we're already translating some of the techniques into the civilian sector to kind of have those abilities that you know we didn't have 
in 2011 to 2017. So it's just been really, really exciting to build this platform and to be really involved in education. So I think the milestone is our team forming around restoration. And then I think hopefully the next milestone is we really can scale and validate the techniques we've come up with. So are you leading the innovation then when it comes to OMS? So in this space, I would definitely say our team is among the leaders. And it's just been really, really exciting with the technology and the operative environment. And our whole thing is readiness and restoration. So we actually will full resection of somebody's lower jaw, transplant part of their leg, do dental implants, 3D printed teeth. And the fastest I've had somebody back to their unit is six weeks post-operatively. And for the military, that's a big deal, right? Because now you've just retained a service member that you normally would have lost. Their unit cohesion is maintained and the warfighter is back in the fight uh, and they're no longer a professional patient. So working on these protocols, working on these techniques, working on this integration has really been my fire. But it sounds like it's your mission, really. Absolutely. And I found a coalition of the willing to help with that mission. And now they're leading me in a lot of techniques. So how and why would you encourage others to pursue service as you have done? I think service, no matter what your background is, where you come from, I think there's something for giving of yourself or being part of something bigger. I always played team sports growing up. I played college volleyball. So I think really the military, anybody who's been on a team sport thrives in a collaborative environment. I don't think there's a better option. That's what motivates me. You don't join the military to make a million dollars a year. You don't join the military to be able to live wherever you want somebody tells you where you're going to live. So really, I encourage people who really like a life of service, find intrinsic value in serving our most valuable resources, which to me is our military members. Absolutely. Wow, Dr. Hammer, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And once again, that is Dr. Dan Hammer. And for more information and the full podcast library, please visit myoms.org. And if you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels. And don't forget to subscribe. And thanks for listening.